Welcome everyone and thanks for joining today's presentation on motivating individuals to take conservation action. My name is Brian Fainer and I'm with the National Park Service and help support our Connected Conservation Initiative, which focuses on how NPS staff and partners can work together to improve natural, cultural, and recreation resources at the landscape level. Today's presentation is the seventh in a series focused on how individuals can help parks and conservation more broadly. Throughout today's presentation, please feel free to enter any questions you have into the questions tab. And we'll take a look at those following the, the two presentations. Also, for those who are interested, we have a closed captioning available, and there's a link to that in the chat box. You can register for future webinars in our webinar series and view past recordings by going to our NPS Connected Conservation um, webpage, and I'll put a link to that momentarily. Um, you can also Google it. Uh, lastly, as a reminder, our webinars are open to the public, so we encourage you to invite your friends, neighbors, colleagues, uh, and partners to future presentations. We, we think um, you'll find them interesting. Now let me introduce our two excellent uh, speakers and uh, presenters with us today. Uh, Brooke Tolley helps conservationists use behavioral insights and communication strategies to motivate audiences to take action and change behaviors. Brooke spent the first decade of her career working in ad agencies like Ogilvy, helping clients reach target audiences to build brand awareness, change preferences, and sell products. In 2007, she joined the NGO Rare which is a really cool organization, um, where she designed and implemented behavior change campaigns that inspired local communities in Mongolia, Thailand, Laos, and Philippines, and encouraged them to adopt more sustainable fishing and hunting practices. Operating independently since 2016, Brooke offers workshops, online courses, and consulting services that provide practical steps for designing communication and outreach plans that create conservation movements. Brooke is joined by Sarah Molina with the National Park Service's Natural Resource Stewardship and Science Directorate. She focuses on applying social science and communication theory to affect stewardship behaviors and supporting the NPS's ability to communicate science to park audiences. Her work advances NPS science communication goals of increasing the nation's science literacy and inspiring the public's commitment to preserve our nation's heritage. I'm very excited to have both of them with us today because as we all know, communication is central to doing anything in conservation. Um, so this is a really important uh, presentation and webinar. So thanks for joining. And with that, I'll hand it over to Brooke. Great, thank you, Brian. Uh, and just uh, let me know for any reason you can't hear me or can't see my slides, uh, but I'm going to move us forward. I'm going to try to move us forward. Here we go. Okay, so I forgot that Brian was going to give my bio, so we don't need most of the things on this slide, actually, but I, I'm really honored to be here. I appreciate both Brian and Sarah reaching out to me to join all of you today. Um, in essence, I train conservationists how to design communication plans that motivate action. I don't think I could have said it better than how Brian said it of communication is just so critical and central to what we're doing and to motivating action to begin with. My goal is to bring together some different fields in different worlds into real practical applications for doing this kind of work, taking from the commercial advertising industry, marketing, uh, global consumer trends, mixing it up with insights from behavioral and social sciences, which Sarah will talk about much more uh, in the next section of this webinar, and some of my firsthand experiences in conservation and experiences that I have working with clients and working with participants of my courses. And I've used these methods for large and small nonprofits, for government agencies, and across the world on topics ranging from uh, Brian mentioned this before, sustainable fishing and hunting practices, to how do we consume responsibly, um, how do we get more people volunteering and engaged in the work that we do, and even things like how do we keep cats indoors. Um, so across the board, in all these different countries, different size organizations, and different topics that we're working on, there's definitely a theme that I see running across all of these is that 
we need more people to do more things to protect the planet. Uh, and truthfully, I think many of us feel like we needed them to be doing this yesterday. So we do have this sense of uh, urgency and urgency and even, um, I think, kind of frustration around this because we needed people to be doing this stuff yesterday. And so what do I mean when I say we need more people? It's not just the general public. It's breaking all of this down into different audience segments. More people means more policymakers, more members of the community, more landowners, more park visitors coming to the national parks, more volunteers, those younger generations that some of us are having a hard time wrapping our heads around more consumers, and even more decision makers and leaders at the business level. And what do I mean when I say more people need to do more things? Well, this truly only scratches the surface of more things, but there's a huge list that we have of reducing energy consumption, water consumption, getting more people to volunteer, composting, recycling, uh, making smarter purchases, and bringing reusable items. Like, again, this is the tip of the iceberg of this really long list we have of things that we need people to start doing or to do more of or to do more consistently. And in many cases, we are putting a lot of different communication efforts out there to try to make those more people do those more things yesterday. And I think many of us are feeling, and probably a lot of you on joining the webinar today and joining us, because we're feeling that sense of frustration, that sense of things aren't moving at the speed and the rate and the trajectory that we really almost desperately need them to be moving at. And that does leave us in some ways kind of hitting our head against the wall saying, why aren't people doing the things that we are asking them to do? This can sometimes lead us to blame our audiences, come up with assumptions of why they're not doing these things. They don't care. They don't understand. They feel like they're too busy. They're spending too much time on their phones. Uh, and, and there's probably worse things we've said out there as well. But the hard truth here and this is some of the hard truth that I'll be delivering in, in this part of the webinar, is that our traditional communication approaches, these are some of the ones I showed just a few slides ago, they're not working hard enough for us anymore. They spend too much time focusing only on awareness of the problem and not the potential solutions that we can take advantage of today. We spend too much time focusing on what not to do as opposed to what people can and even should be doing. We've spent too much time and even real estate in our communication efforts using shame or guilt to get people to care or using doom and gloom and fear of loss to spark action. And research shows, study shows more and more that this is not the method that's going to achieve sustained and long-term action and change among all these groups of people that we need to be engaging. Therefore, it's time for us to flip the script, to try new approaches, to adopt new techniques that allow us the opportunity to engage many more people on our different causes. And again, these can be small action-oriented causes. We need people to sign a petition. These could be big, massive, complex behavior change causes. In all of these causes, we need to look at adopting new ways of doing this so that we get more people on board. And it starts with understanding a bit more about how social movements happen in the first place. Um, and I like to use a visual analogy to help us think about a theory that I'm going to explain in more detail on the next slide. Um, and I think we're all familiar with this moment in time that tends to happen at sporting events called the wave. And there's a, quite a number of sporting events happening out there right now. I mean, we're in NFL season, uh, so the wave happens there. Just finished the World Series. Baseball is a very popular place for the wave to occur. Um, there is, you know, college sports out, just, you know, an endless list of sports happening right now where you can experience the wave in person if you're there or see it on TV. And I think if you've experienced this, you know that the wave tends to happen in 
a relatively similar set of patterns and activities. And usually it's kind of a small group and they decide on their own free will that I'm gonna start the wave. And they just get up out of their seats and they do you know, this motion, right? They're up there and they're trying to start the wave. They don't know if anybody else is going to follow them. And maybe they're not even all that really concerned about whether or not anybody else is going to follow them. They're taking that initiative and they're trying to start it. And usually then the next thing that happens, there's a few other kind of small groups, maybe near that initial group or far away who sees them trying to start the wave. And they say, oh, hey, that group's trying to start the wave. Next time it comes over here, I'm going to join it. And those of us sitting there, you can kind of see that happening, say, oh, you know, those people are trying to start the wave. And then soon, it's just like magic, it is flowing around the stadium. Uh, and I have a GIF of this. I'm not sure if it's going to show up on screen. But you see when that magic does happen, when that moment, when it goes from just a few people kind of doing it here and there to this coordinated effort that is happening among thousands and thousands of strangers in unison. I mean, it's, it's almost a phenomenal thing to view. And I like to think of this visual, again, to explain one of my favorite theories on how social movements and social change happens. I know it's sort of nerdy to have a favorite theory, but uh, you know, I'm not, not too shy to be a nerd on this topic or like to nerd out on this. So I want us to keep this visual in, in mind of what the wave looks like when it happens and if we've experienced it in person, maybe where you sit in that pattern of the movement happening, of the wave happening. And now we're gonna look at some of the theory behind that. This is the, the diffusion of innovation theory. It was developed in the 70s by Everett Rogers. And it explains the how, why, and at what rate of new ideas and technology and behaviors spread among a given group or community or audience. And if you look at the bottom left of your screen, it starts with those innovators. That's those brave individuals who are willing to just go out there and give it a try. Now they're taking a fairly big social risk in doing that because they don't know if they're going to look kind of funny, kind of strange. And most of the folks who sit in this innovator category aren't all that concerned about looking sort of funny or strange or like an outlier. And I think this visual may show up too. This is a gentleman trying to start the wave at Wimbledon. Uh, and if you're familiar with Wimbledon, that is not really a place where they like that level of fanfare. Uh, and certainly, I don't think the wave is going to take off. But, you know, this innovator, he's not concerned about others following him. He just goes and do it. He's a, a fairly big person. Now, right on the heels of innovators, you have early adopters. So, again, you think of the wave, the innovator is that, that individual, that small group of individuals starting to take in the initiative. Early adopters are going to be second, third folks who are following. So they're not going to take the initiative, but they will really follow initiative. So they need to see that somebody else has started it. Hey, Brooke, we're yep. sorry to interrupt. We're, we're getting a little bit of static, I think, on the receiving end. All right, let me just adjust some things here. How does that sound? Perfect. Thank you. Okay. I'm also going to just make sure my hair is not in the way. Um, yeah, so the early adopters are right on the heels of those innovators. So they're gonna be, they're, again, they're not gonna take the initiative themselves, but they are like gonna jump right in. The group after early adopters, the early majority. This is a fairly large group. And now the percentages here follow your sort of standard deviation bell curve. Uh, and I presented it here as an S curve because it helps explain a bit more how it works. So this is a fairly large group. They do wait a bit longer and they need to see and receive different things to jump on board than the innovators or early adopters need to see, right? They wanna sort of give it time, see how this plays out. Is it gonna stick around? Are other people really doing it? Do people I know and trust and look up to, are they doing it? And what's really gonna be in it for me to take the time, energy and effort to also do this? But we see in this sort of bell curve that 
an S-curve, once we shift from this early adopter to early majority, the speed and rate at which people are likely to adopt this new idea, technology, or behavior starts to really speed up. So the early majority is a very important group to engage. Yet because they need different things than the innovators and early adopters, this is where many of our behavior change projects tend to stall. Because the traditional approaches, the ones I mentioned before, they work pretty well up through early adopters. Right? Think of the folks who are our loyal followers. They're already primed and ready to make lifestyle changes to benefit the planet. Think of us, right? We don't need that much to start making changes in our lives, to grab the reusable bottle, to ditch the plastic straws. But early majority need something different. And this is really, that gap is where we really need to flip the script on the approaches that we're using. Because it's critical to get this early majority group on board, because once they start adopting the behavior, the late majority does too. And granted, it takes them longer. They really do want to see it play out. But at some point, when enough people have adopted the behavior, the late majority feels like they're getting left out. And they join in because everyone else is already starting to do it. Certainly, we have a laggard group at the end here. These are folks who can't join in, can't adopt the behavior, or simply they won't. And they're not a small group. They are, you know, 16, 15%. Another mistake we make is we jump to the laggard. We want to get the, the skeptics, the haters on board right after we get the early adopters on board. But we're missing a real opportunity to get to a majority social norm by focusing our attention on early majority and late majority. Uh, and another reason I really like this theory is it helps us make a connection, a mental connection between individual change that we are often asking people to do and how that grows into social change, larger social change and impact and movements. Uh, so it's not just the, that one individual, it's how it all adds up to something bigger. And the reason we see this playing out over and over again comes back to this human truth is that we are a social herd species. And we crave belonging and we crave being part of something. This is just how we're built. Even us lone wolves out there, we still want to have a pack that we belong to. Um, and so this really drives so many of the things that we do and the reasons why we are willing to do new and different things. But I want to now transition out of the, the theory. Again, it's a theory I love and it's something I think we can all start to look around us and see oh, where have I seen this diffusion curve play out in things that I'm a part of or things that I see happening around me um, and kind of explore. It can be almost a fun weekend game, if you will. I guess for, for us nerds out there, it could be a fun weekend game. Um, but let's move into the practical. So how do we actually use this theory to help us think about starting and growing these social movements for our own efforts? And this comes back to the behavioral insights and communication strategies. So certainly we wanna be able to understand our audiences and get to know what is preventing action. There can also be a long list of things here some of the most common factors we see are status quo bias. Simply, it's easier for me to keep doing what I'm doing now than to do anything new or different. And this holds true for all of us in some form or another. Choice overload. There are just too many options out there and I'm not clear or certain which one is the best option to take to achieve either my goals or the goals that I've set out to do. Risk aversion. This could also you know, be known as fear of change. The trade-offs that you're asking of me feel like I'm going to lose more than what I'm going to gain. And that makes it hard for me to say yes to change. Or hassle factors, but could be these kind of small little inconveniences or even annoyances in a process that turn people off. So again, there's many more factors behind this, but just having some insight on what tends to prevent action for our specific audience and for humans more broadly. And on the flip side of this, we want to increase the number of communication strategies we're using that motivate action. Things like social proof, showing that other people are doing the behavior, 
empowerment, tapping into that desire for belonging, and providing benefits that are personal and meaningful for the audience. I'm going to get into these in more details in the next few slides. But by reducing those barriers to change, increasing the communication strategies that motivate action, we'll ultimately be moving our audience forward. Again, that's starting and growing these movements. And it all starts with having a very clear and specific ask. What is it that we want people to do? Skip the rinse, take five, ask for tap. This helps us chart the path forward for the audience. So they are not uncertain about what they can do to help create change, to make the world a better place. And by not throwing everything into one communication piece, all together like that kitchen sink approach, we can do one ask at a time to avoid that feeling of choice overload of, oh my goodness, there's 101 things I could be doing. I'm now overwhelmed and I'm not gonna do anything. And I'm not really sure which of these will have the most impact. So all of our communication, our motivating communication should start with that clear and specific ask. And then I encourage us to explore how can we make this behavior as easy as possible to do? We don't always take this extra step, right? Usually we just kind of put it on our audience to go figure it out, figure out how you can do this. How can you take a five minute shower? Well, you know, that's on you audience to time yourself. But maybe we can provide tools, resources, tips, suggestions, and support that make it easier for them. Maybe it's a thing they stick in the shower so they can time themselves or provide a set of songs that are three minute or five minute long that they can play or sing in the shower to time themselves. Reducing food waste at home, using technology to make it as easy as possible. A lot of the things we are asking people to do tend to sound easier on paper than they are in reality. And I encourage us to see how can I make this as easy as possible for my audience to make it more likely that they'll start it and keep doing it. And very much related to the diffusion of innovation theory, how can we provide some sense of social proof that other people are already doing this behavior or that more and more people are trying to start doing the behavior? It doesn't even mean it has to be a majority of people are doing it. We are already motivated just by knowing that people are trying to make changes in their lives and it primes us to be ready to make those changes ourselves. Part of our job as communicators, how can we make those behaviors more visible? Those in, 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 invisible at-home behaviors, how can we show that more and more people are doing them? How can we demonstrate what good looks like? So using relatable messengers, uh, using some data that you have in terms of how many people are getting on board all helps to provide social proof. Even uh, you know your your puppers and doggos, you know they're they're social proof messengers as well. Who can resist a cute dog telling you what to do? We also want to explore ways that we can empower the audience. We don't tend to do this as much, and this I don't think I don't think this comes quite as naturally to us. We uh, to kind of our traditional approaches have been to talk down to our audiences even as far as like berating our audience for what they're doing. If we look at what commercial advertising does uh, and really where more and more like public health field is going, there's a COVID example on the screen, empowerment goes a long way to help the audience believe that change is possible, right? That it's even possible and it's within their means to play a role in making that change possible. Right? That is powerful stuff for us as humans. And we can use feedback loops to show how they're doing. Like this is, oh, you know, you know, oops, you made a mistake in your recycling bin this week. You're not a bad person. It happens. Here's how to improve it so that we can do better next time. Or here's the impact we're having as it grows, as you contribute to this cause. This can be a really powerful approach that is often unutilized and underutilized in our work. related to social proof and the diffusion theory, invite the audience to be, become part of something bigger, right? We have that sense of belonging, that desire to be part of something. And we can show the movement as it's happening, as it's growing. 
all these folks are participating in No Mow May. Join us. Make your backyard a wildlife sanctuary. And I mentioned benefits earlier, and that can really come down to making it personal. Uh, oftentimes, we want our audience to do these desired behaviors for the same reasons that we think they should do them, or even the same reasons why we ourselves, as conservationists, do them. But our audience may need some different reasons to do it. And if we can get creative here and get to know our audience and focus on the benefits they get from doing the behavior, we'll see much more traction and movement. Like, hey, no water also means no beer. Oh goodness, that's really motivating for a certain segment of your audience. Really making it personal, I named a tree after you. All right, so let's help protect this tree. And a bit of a throwback to, I know the webinar that uh, you guys held uh, last month uh, on you know, Homegrown National Park, which I love that as an example, it's very cool. You know, helps them feel good about it. Look, I'm on the map. And I, it also taps into, I'm part of something bigger. So help people feel good about the impact that they're having and focus on the benefits that they get out of it. And lastly, look for some ways to have some fun with it. We can have fun with these messages, with these approaches, and get more of our audience members on board. People care more about a bat, so why don't you dress like a bat for Halloween? That one which just came out a few, few days ago, I guess Halloween was last week. Say the planet Beyonce lives on, or even try hosting a pollinator celebration meal and invite all your friends and family members to it as well. So there are ways that even using some of the previous approaches I talked about, we can still infuse some fun into that. And that pretty much concludes what I have to say today. I strongly believe all of us can do this, even if we don't have a marketing and communication or community outreach background. Some of this is about making strategic and yet even small shifts in how we talk to our audience. So we can focus on making it more social, more safe, even socially safer to do, more meaningful for our audience, and more impactful and fun for them as well. So again, thank you so much for having me today. I do have a dedicated page on my website for this webinar, uh, brooktully.com slash NPS. There's some resources in there that I've referenced today, and it's kind of you can dive even further into some of these topics. And I did include a fun quiz on the page for why some traditional approaches aren't really working hard enough for us. So I hope you have some time today or this week to check that out. Thank you. go. Um, thank you, Brooke. I thought it was great. And I might, it, well, Brian introduced me. I'm Sarah Molina. Um, and in my presentation here, I'm going to put it up on the screen. You'll see um, some of what Brooke was talking about, some examples that she shared come to life um, in some National Park Service and other land management um, examples. So let me make sure that I am sharing my screen properly. Okay. Um, so in this portion of the webinar, we're going to, I'm going to show examples and explore how social marketing, which um, we're going to base on behavior change theories, can be used to encourage stewardship amongst park visitors to benefit resource preservation and visitor enjoyment. So sort of thinking back to what Brooke said, what's in it for me of visitor enjoyment? Who's my audience? It is part visitors coming to our parks who um, want to have a wonderful experience while they are visiting national parks. So you know, I'm going to start off with saying I think we can all agree that um, NPS staff and visitors, really the public, should be involved in park stewardship. It's not just the job of one. And in a perfect world, um, people believe in the NPS mission, understand and appreciate parks in the natural world, and awareness and appreciation and that awareness and appreciation results in people taking care of parks. Um, and as somebody pointed out earlier, that um, conservation is not just about biology, it's not just about the plants and animals, but it's about the people and the choices that they make. So in a perfect world, everybody's on board and it's easy. Um, 
but people are complicated and great intentions don't always lead to action. I have great intentions to go running this evening. It's gonna get dark and cold. And so that intention may not actually turn out into a run. I still hope it does. So um, one of the approaches, as Brooke said earlier, um, is that people often turn to an information or a public awareness campaign. And this can commonly rely on the distribution of information and the general assumption that if someone knows more about an issue, they'll make better choices. And the Park Service and, and many organizations um, build campaigns around resource protection. So if you know more, you will protect this wonderful place. And it's important. You know, information is helpful for people making decisions. But it, like everything, it also has limitations. And so when it comes, um, there's some challenges when it comes to behavior change and its limitations in parks. So for one thing, um, our messaging frequently appeals strongly to people who already care about protecting parks. So maybe that goes back to the um, innovators and early adopters. They're sort of already on board with conservation and resource protection in parks. So it's an easy thing to kind of get them to do, you know, to, to do the things that we are um, sharing information about. So we use another piece of that, that to think about too, is that we use conservation as the motivating appeal. Um, but that doesn't always lead to action. And, you know, it, it, it appeals to people, you know, we're focusing our appeal on people who are motivated by that idea of conservation. What if they're not motivated by conservation? What if they're motivated about having a, a really fantastic experience in this place that they will only visit once? How do we support that motivation while also um, kind of lifting up or supporting conservation actions? Another challenge is that can, it can be hard to convey um, complicated concepts with really broad messages. You know, I think about the birds that I feed in my yard, and those are the same species or many of the same species that I will encounter in a park. So why is it okay for me to feed the birds in my yard, but not in a park? Just because the location has changed, the rules have changed, the species don't change. So I think it just, it gets complicated um, with some of the ideas that we're trying to share. So, you know, we, we just, we have to keep that in mind that if we are conveying these really broad messages, um, people may not understand what we're trying to say. And so we have to dive down into very specific actions that we are hoping people to take while they're visiting a park. Um, and as Brooke pointed out, fear appeals have significant limitations. People only have so much capacity for anxiety. And I think this plays out in the climate change conversation. It's just like, how much can I be scared about climate change on a given day? Um, and so it's challenging to use fear as a motivator because it can also lead to apathy. So, you know, there is a place for information campaigns and, um, within conservation agencies, but I wanna add to that and kind of as we just said, or it was just, I was just saying, there are some limitations. And so what I wanna do is add to that um, another approach, social marketing that we can use to encourage behavior change um, and conservation of park resources. So what is social marketing? It's a process that uses traditional marketing principles and techniques to influence behaviors that benefit society as well as the individual. Um, you know, and as uh, Brooke was talking, she pointed out the diffusion of innovation curve. And I wanna kind of overlay that or use that in this um, graphic that you're seeing here and um, put it in the place of the National Park Service. So how we think about encouraging people to do what we need them to do to protect resources while they're visiting the park. And so you can kind of think about that, um, those innovators and early adopters in that show me where we have our education campaigns that can help develop the skills um, and the stewardship ethic that will in, you know, get them on board with um, engaging in resource protection, conservation behaviors and parks. 
And then on the other side of it, there's sort of, um, I can't remember the name, laggards, um, people who just, they're gonna need, they're gonna need someone to make them do that. And we have enforcement um, to kind of help that group along. In the middle, those um, early and late majority, that's where we can um, add a social marketing strategy to our toolbox to encourage that larger majority of people to adopt the behaviors that will help protect the place that they're hoping to, or that they're visiting, and have the experience that they're hoping to have while visiting parks. So social marketing has roots in public health. Um, I did a quick search today just to pull up some examples, and the CDC has used the approach in campaigns to increase breastfeeding, prevent the spread of HIV, reduce smoking, um, improve sort of attention to heart um, condition, make sure that they're preventing heart disease. So there's just a lot of examples of social marketing in public health field. It's also beginning to be applied more in areas of sustainability and conservation. And in 2014, the Society of Conservation Biology established the Conservation Marketing and Engagement Workgroup to advance the study and practice um, of using marketing techniques to advance conservation goals. So um, some big ideas around social marketing. Um, formative research is designed to help understand the context in which the behavior occurs and barriers and benefits individuals might encounter when performing the behavior. So you can sort of think about that as the broad social science um, research that can help us understand uh, our visitors and where they're coming from. The interventions, the way that we encourage people or um, tools that we can use to encourage people to adopt behaviors that will help protect parks um, are designed to encourage very specific behaviors, as Brooke mentioned a little bit earlier. There are behavior change theories um, to help design and target those strategies. And then it draws from psychology, human behavior change, and communication. So broadly, um, we'll run through the general approach. Um, different practitioners, different frameworks will have a number of different steps, but these kind of cover um, a broad five that you'll see regularly throughout different social marketing frameworks. So the first is to select the very specific behaviors, um, which what are the behaviors we want to encourage or discourage? And again, going back to the beginning, the focus is on the behavior, not just the awareness. And I think this picture here is a nice example of making sure it is the actual sort of final thing that we want to see. Like This is a pretty clean campsite. All the litter's picked up. It's just sort of, you know, neatly placed in one location. But what we really want to see is that litter put in a secured trash can. Um, so you really have to think about what is that final thing that we want to see. So that is what we are going to be focused on and, or use to focus our strategy. Um, next, you want to go through a series of diagnostic questions to help prioritize where to put your time and energy. So how impactful is the behavior? How many people are already doing it? And how probable is it that those who are not doing it will do it in the future? So this is a really nice um, example that the Chesapeake Bay program put together. They surveyed um, community members around the Chesapeake Bay around a set of behaviors that were important for conservation of the bay, and then asked them, you know, how likely are you to adopt this behavior in the future? Um, are you doing it already and how likely are you to adopt it in the future? And then they could prioritize where can we put our time and energy, our limited resources to um, get people to protect the bay. The next thing you want to do or want to consider um, and focus on is um, once you have your sets of specific behaviors is you want to decrease um, I'm sorry, increase the barriers to the behaviors you want to discourage. You want to make it harder for people to do things you don't want them to do. And you want to make it easier for them to do things, do the things you do want them to do. It's a bit of a uh, tongue twister there for me. 
Um, and simultaneously, we, you want to um, flip that and you want to um, increase the benefits of doing the things you want them to do. And, um, yeah, and and decrease the benefits of doing the things you don't want them to do. So you really got to think about all aspects of the behaviors. And then go through, develop a strategy, pilot, implement, and evaluate. So I'm going to share, um, quickly run through a couple examples um, of what that looks like around conservation issues that are of concern to land management agencies. So in this first example, is. Um, it's from the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources, and they um, developed a social marketing strategy to prevent the spread of aquatic invasive species. So I'm gonna focus on a very specific um, part of their approach where they prioritized which behaviors they wanted to focus on in their strategy. So they came up with a list of over 150 discrete behaviors behaviors that anglers could adopt to prevent the spread of aquatic invasive species. And that's a lot. And if you try and talk about all of them, it's information overload. Um, and it sort of becomes this very general, well, sure, I'm doing something to prevent the spread of aquatic invasive species. That's not specific enough. It's hard to know where to start. So once they had their list of 150 plus, they used an expert panel to rank the behaviors and assign a score. Um, and so in this, you'll see the impact column um, from four disposable, uh, disposal of unused live bait in garbage has a really high impact. Um, it also has a high average uptake of how many people are likely to adopt this behavior. And there's a large market, a pretty large market opportunity. You know, um, a lot of people have the potential to adopt it. So that disposable disposal of unused live bait and garbage is a really um, good place for them to put their time and energy. On the flip side, this purchase of low, non or low risk species has a high impact. Um, let's see, but yeah, it has a high impact, but a lower likelihood of uptake. So let me see, where did it go? Disposal. Oh my goodness. I meant to put a, <laughs> a highlight in here, but this um, purchase of uh, low risk species. So average impact was a 3.6 but the average uptake was 2.9, which meant not as many people are likely to do this um, going forward. So you could put some time and energy in there, but it's not gonna yield um, as great a result. And with you know, limited resources, it's important to put our time and energy into the things that we have the greater, greatest opportunity to have an impact with. So what they ended up doing is they put together um, these compost bins and the uh, <clears throat> the department, Minnesota DNR, offered grants to units to implement these. So these compost bins were likely to have a high impact. There are a lot of people that could do it and that would make a good um, sort of uh, change or had a, a good impact on the prevention of the spread of aquatic invasive species. So that's where they decided to um, focus their conservation campaign around aquatic invasive species. Another example, um, so coral reefs are under threat by a large, you know, a number of different issues. There's climate change, there's ocean acidification, there's pollution, um, and a variety of different stressors. On top of that, um, the sunscreens that people put on before they go out snorkeling to, um, you know, to experience and see our beautiful coral reefs can harm corals. So the Park Service wanted to develop a strategy to um, encourage people to use other types of sun protection. So they could use mineral-based sunscreen or cover up as two alternatives to chemical-based sunscreens. And that would remove one of the stressors to our coral reefs or minimize it. Um, we worked with uh, behavioral scientists at Ideas 42 
and with input from social scientists at George Mason University and went through a process to define and diagnose the behave very specific behaviors um, that needed to be changed and then use that to design strategies that parks could implement. So what came of this project um, was a set of barriers to adopting the sun protection behaviors that would be more or less harmful to coral reefs. And we did that through literature reviews, discussion with staff and partner organizations. And then these barriers, we turned into a playbook of ideas. So parks could look through this and say, okay, you know, this is what could work with my audience and in my setting. An example of one of the um, strategies that we encouraged is a pledge to um, use mineral-based sunscreens or cover-up when visiting um, coral reef parks and, for that matter, um, any rec water recreation areas because um, sunscreens aren't just harmful to coral reefs. They have, can be harmful to other aquatic ecosystems. Mm -hmm. And so what you can do here is you can take the pledge and as you take the pledge, um, you can drop a little pin on where you are to short show that other people are doing and engaging in this behavior as well. Because um, so, you know what you wear for sunscreen, that's not a very visible behavior to anybody else. So we needed a way to make that behavior and make that choice more visible to other people. Okay, I think, um, so I'm gonna run through this really quick. So we. We have an example from safe wildlife viewing where we wanted to target um, the safe distance from wildlife because a safe distance from wildlife um, may differ across people and there are rules and regulations. So we made sure we were very specific there. Um, some barriers we saw with safe wildlife viewing distances um, could be the ability to measure distance, to judge distance, and what other people around me are doing. If they're getting close to wildlife, you know, maybe I want to have that experience too. And the benefits we saw in this example was having a really great experience, um, having a great wildlife encounter that you could share with friends and family. So we use those ideas um, to develop a campaign that focused on making the safe distance enjoyable, um, making it easy to judge distance to get the picture people wanted, and making it popular by um, utilizing social media to show what other people are doing. We evaluated the campaign through observation and saw increase in three of the four parks that we implemented the campaign in. Um, at one of the four at the Grand Canyon, there was a decrease in um, how close people got, but on the flip side, there were fewer people who were within four yards. So there were few, fewer people getting really, really close. Um, so there's, you know, it's not perfect across the board, but it did make an increase across most of our parks. Um, Redwoods National Park implemented a crumb clean campaign. The conservation issue here was an endangered bird. Um, the Marbled murelet pictured here is an endangered species at Redwoods and the park is an important breed, breeding ground for the bird. They nest really high up in the Redwoods and spend their most spend most of their time out on the ocean. So they aren't frequently seen by visitors. There's not a real connection between the murelet and visitors. And they were suffering from nest predation. Cameras identified the main culprits as stellars, jays, and crows. And research showed that they were in higher concentration around campgrounds. So the consequences of not addressing this issue were for visitors, the potential closure of campgrounds to protect the endangered species. And for the birds, it was all about survival. So the barriers that the park decided to focus on were a suite of behaviors behaviors related to keeping a clean campground so that jays and crows could not get access to food. They surveyed visitors to understand people's motivations, they observed um, visitor behavior, and they looked at existing interpretive materials to understand how um, the park was communicating about this issue. They found there was not a lot of intentional feeding and that people want to know what they were supposed to do. What are the things, what is the behavior, what are the things that I need to do um, to help protect this species? 
And so they implemented a new strategy, telling people what to do, model the behavior they wanted to see, and using consistent messaging um, in the park and then at other parks um, that were habitat for the marbled murrelet. So um, if you go to California Parks and Recreation and you want to book a campsite, you have a video to watch. You, um, they're asking you to make a commitment to keep your campsite crumb clean. And the really cool thing about this, um, in a later study of seven, seven picnic areas in Big Basin Redwood State Park, which is part of the California State Park System, they found that compared to three years pre-management, the post-management treatment resulted in significantly lower amounts of anthropogenic food in the Jays diet. So there were less crumbs left out, um, which was good for the Jays, which was good for the murelets. So you can you can sort of make a connection between the um, strategies and the outcome. So I just want to point out, you know, this this sort of approach is being used all over the place. Um, I and depending on how many of you are NPS, um, participate in the bike to work bike to work month in May, um, which is organized through Love to Ride. And I was scrolling through their website and saw behavior change theory as part of how they encourage more people to um, ride their bikes to work. There is social marketing approaches using used to um, protect bears and help keep bears and humans safe. Um, campaigns and social marketing conservation efforts and in energy and sustainability. I'm always proud because this is my little feedback about my energy use and I feel really good about it. And I've told, I don't know, tens, twenties, hundreds of people um, that this sort of, in, you know, feedback makes me feel really good and um, encourages me to be more conscious, you know, to conserve energy in my house. So, I wanted to put in a few resources that I use. You'll see Brooke's name on there. I go back and look at her blogs quite a bit, so I encourage you to do so. Um, and a couple of other resources that I look at frequently. And that is the end of my um, bit, Brian. So I'm gonna turn it over to you. Great, thank you so much, Sarah and Brooke. Two amazing presentations um, on really, again, a super important topic. What are we doing with our time to make a difference at the end of the day? Are we getting people to help and to, to make a difference? So again, folks, if you have a question, um, type it into the questions tab and I'll, um, I'll communicate it to um, Brooke and Sarah. Um, to get us going though, um, Is it fair to say that the you know conservation groups, the feds, the states, anybody who does conservation professionally, that we make a lot of assumptions, <laughs> and it's really be, it's kind of a lazy way of doing outreach. You know, we're making assumptions about what we think the public will do. Like you know, maybe for the park service, we talk about what we do, but we don't necessarily talk about how people can help is it how, how do how does the, the the area around making assumptions relate to motivated motivating individuals and getting into behavior um, human behavior that Sarah sense? do you want to tackle that from kind of mm -hmm. the research perspective at least yeah you know I mean I think I go through this a lot because it's hard to do social science. It takes a long time to do social science. When you add on top of that, um, sort of the, the restrictions that we have, it really, there are huge barriers internally to um, using social science to develop campaign strategies. And so we, we tend to stumble over that, I think. But at the flip side of it, you know, I think I look at, well, I know I look at Brooke, I look at Brian and I, I look you know, I bet if I look down the attendees, I'd see a lot of names that I recognize and think, you know, we're all here for the same sort of reason. We've already decided that conservation is a motivating factor for us. Um, and so, 
you know, it's hard to see a diversity of motivation when we're all kind of coming to it from the same place. We've already dedicated our careers and um, to this sort of work. And so I don't think we see the world as well as we can. And, and I'll go back. I love what Chesapeake Bay program did. They have a whole webinar on it. To me, in a way, that is something that I would love to see more of. Um, and I think it really helps us understand where we can put our time and energy um, rather than, you know, maybe trying to hit our heads against the wall to get those last people to do the thing we needed them to do and forgetting about oh, everybody else that maybe just need that little bit of a nudge to get in um, sort of to, to help with our conservation efforts. Anything to add, Brooke? Um, I would say, I think another gap there is we start with our frustrations and we start with what we want to say. And I think that's natural. I don't think we can train ourselves out of starting with what we want to say. I mean, this is in our personal lives, just as much in our work lives, just as much in outreach. Uh, and, but I think the the thing that we can teach ourselves is how to take that pause to say, okay, I know that's what I want to say, but what does this particular audience need? And how do I kind of bring that together in a way that's going to be compelling for them? Um, and certainly conducting primary research is awesome. There also is a lot of secondary research out there that can help us at least form hypotheses. So we move past an assumption to a hypothesis for this audience that then can get validated through different re you know, primary research methods. Because there's a lot of folks collecting a lot of data out there on the corporate side uh, and the nonprofit side, environmental side, and that helps at least jolt us out of just what I want to say into a place of, oh, this is what's going on in their world and maybe how we can reposition what we want to say to something that's going to be more meaningful for them. I guess relating to that is you, you made the point about empowerment, um, which is, of course, crucial to motivating individuals to take conservation action. Actually, you've got to empower them with information and an ask, right? Um, a clear ask. So why do you think it is, you know, as rare as it is to get, you know, a lot of clear messages, again, from NGOs, Fed, states, professional conservationists, why, why do you think it's as rare as it is for you to see resources that empower the public to get involved? That's a great question. Um, and I think that certainly our urgency is driving some of that. Uh, and that, you know, truth be told, like, the future looks a little bleak. <laughs> it's like we're not getting that much data saying like it's all going to be okay tomorrow. Don't worry about a thing. Um, and that's scary. Uh, and we tend to think that we need to spark action by scaring the crap out of people because the future looks daunting. Um, but those and those are you know that that reality that the future doesn't look great is a, is a real thing. But when we start talking about communication and motivation, it's, that doesn't inspire people. It doesn't mm -hmm. motivate. That is a feeling of there's nothing we can do. All hope is lost. And I'm just going to crawl under my weighted blanket and like call it a day. Um, and yeah. so that is where we do need to flip the script. Like this is a reality, but there's the other reality too is that there are solutions that we can fight for and advocate for and start to adopt that will at least prevent us from total dread. And empowerment is what people need to feel like I have that ability to affect change. And it's within me and it's within all the systems and I play a role in helping to change those systems. Yeah. And I would, I mean, going back to your presentation in the beginning, I sort of think about, um, all the things like there are hundreds and hundreds and thousands of things that I could do and if I look and be like man I can't do all of them so do I do any of them and I would venture to guess too if you look across different 
agencies or think about you know government conservation broadly you know is what you tell brooke the same as what you tell me is the same as the person who lives in the middle of the city you know do we all need to take the same action is it reasonable for all of us to do the same thing um and i think you know going back to how do you prioritize based on your sort of audience and context um, makes it important you know in some ways maybe all those little things happening in little places build up to a big conservation goal but starting with that big conservation message makes me go well which one um yeah. do i do? so maybe that is think locally <laughs> and if wow. i can add one more thing to that i mean part of what I focus on in, in my like longer form course is thinking about the journey of change for a specific audience because uh, you know as Sarah mentioned like the end goal may be something massive you know it's sustainable consumption uh, you know sustainable household and there's you know, dozens of things that you know fall under that category and you know given a lifespan so what is that journey for them what do they start with what can they start to incorporate as a habit what do we ask them to include next and how can we not just have these one-off efforts but think of it as we are continuing to grow multiple movements on multiple stages of behavior change and how do we keep that going so and that often means have sarah alluded to this too like multiple threads of outreach happening for different audiences sequentially and sometimes in parallel um, and it's no small amount of work and i think that's part of the the change that happens industry-wide as well is realizing communications can't just be thrown on at the end of something after you know, an intervention strategy has been planned out it needs to come at social science and communication needs to be embedded really from the beginning i put um brooke a, a link in the chat to the to the next uh webinar because it kind of really tees off of of this one um we've got brandon uh, scour with rare and adam snyder with the nature conservancy and they're going to talk about to kind of what you're just getting at um brooke you know how collective actions you know addressing these big challenges can lead to larger things like you know passing a, a ballot measure you know a conservation ballot me measure like what TNC often uh, sometimes works on. So, real quick, what what Sarah, what you're getting at? Do you think like it's um, and this there's a question to this too. It's like there's this. How, how do we deal with this compassion fatigue? I mean, you know, there's ecological burnout. Um, you know, that's the question. And just adding on to that, it seems like you know there's a stereotype and you know conservation or environmentalism, whatever you want to call it like it's like you're 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 in or you're out like it's all or nothing and you know and it's not based on reality for how people function <laughs> we make i've made a million well not, hopefully not a million but i've made already today i've made some i i, I could have done i could have biked to work so i for my electric hybrid minivan to work but um like, is that a part of this? I mean, you just, how do you deal with that? Like, it, it, you can always do better. And people think about, well, again, yeah, there's all this bad stuff happening. COP, you know, in, in Egypt right now, you know, BBC, they talked about how things are not going as well as they should be. There's no mention of anything about what individuals could do. It's all about this big international stuff. How do we make it real for people so they actually want to, easy question yeah well i don't know maybe this is what you would say brooke but i to me it goes back to what's in it for me like it's not conservation for conservation's sake you know but can we talk about what those actions are in terms of what is valuable to that person's experience so in you know in relation to how we thought about it for campaigns we've done in parks is how can we support a really great visitor experience that also has the conservation behaviors as part of what we're trying to get people to do. So it's not about, you know, come and protect parks. It's about come and have a really great experience. And this is how you do it. Um, 
So I came across a paper that was called Integrating Social Marketing into Sustainable Resource Management at Padre Island. And there's this great quote that really makes me think about, you know, we always talk about the dual mission of conservation and enjoyment and not always being in alignment. And this reframed it for me in a really wonderful way um, in that they wrote, because exchange is the primary concept underlying social marketing, understanding what benefits the visitors pursue in the park can assist the park in better engaging them in exchange for their support for conservation. So what does the visitor want? And what can we give them in conservation or in exchange for what we want? Um, and I thought that was a nicer way of framing it instead of the like dual mission, you know, mm. what the visitor wants being at odds with our conservation is, can we do this exchange? Like you do this and we'll give you that. Um, and I loved it. I'm thinking of another quote too. And, and Brian, you were talking about like, there are things I could have done better today, right? And uh, I, I'm going to be paraphrasing the quote, and I don't even know who said it, but you know, don't let perfection be the enemy of progress. Yeah. Um, and I think, I mean, we're so hard on ourselves. I think having some grace for ourselves, first off, because what does perfect even mean? And it's a, that's a moving target constantly as we have more data, as we know more things we need to be doing, and we, we're adapting our own behaviors regularly. I mean, the plastic straw thing was just like two or three years ago. I mean, it wasn't that long ago. You know, so that, that was a brand new thing that sort of went viral and became popular. And we, we need to be agile enough to adapt and move and to cut ourselves some slack that you know, life is hard and perfect probably isn't attainable. Um, and if we can do that to ourselves, then we also really need to do that for an audience that um, you know, is probably starting some of these things for the first time and are gonna mess up along the way and not let those mess ups be equal to like total regression and giving up, but to a grace period of, all right, but now we're at Monday again. You can start meal planning this week, even though you skipped last week. Um, and I think those are some of the tools that we can provide to support our audience in the change because it's not gonna be easy along the way. Yeah. Um, awesome. Uh, Brooke, before we wrap things up, do you mind just real quick talking about the types of workshops? Like I, I put a link to your uh, web page there earlier, but do you do trainings for the feds or how do you, how do you function? Yeah, I do. Uh, so I run an online course. It's sort of an eight week live course. Uh, you're part of a cohort uh, and it's, a, I'm biased of course, but it's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, and you dive a lot deeper into these topics and work on worksheets uh, in tandem with the live lessons. So you can really apply the concepts to a project you're working on. I actually just wrapped up the last uh, course for 2022. The next one in 2023 will be uh, in the April, May timeframe. Uh, so more information will be coming on that. Uh, and workshops, I do offer workshops for organizations and even you know, groups that are working to collaborate on a shared topic. Uh, these can be ha usually half day virtual workshops, about three, three and a half hours where you get into a lot of these core concepts, get some brainstorming happening in the moment to just you know, play and practice a little bit. Uh, and then there's opportunities to kind of deep dive into working sessions from that training where if there's a particular department, a particular audience, a behavior change, you need to get into the weeds and details, we can do that in an add-on working session. Um, and all that sure. stuff is, uh, information is available on the site. Cool. All right, well, um, any closing thoughts, Sarah or Brooke, for, that we didn't get to? You don't have to. Yeah, no, I appreciate the time. I appreciate hearing Brooke, because I've read a lot of your blogs and shared them, so it's nice to hear from you and the um, kind of way you present things. So that it was a lot of fun for me, Brian, to do this. And I hope our audience is, um, had the same experience. Yeah, and thank you so much for having me. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. And you know, I guess closing thoughts is, uh, you know, on that empowerment tip again, that, you know, it's, it is within all of our means to, to do yeah. all of this, to take that pause and say, what is my receiver on the communication end? What might mean most to them and how can I maybe adjust accordingly? Yeah. And top tip, again, at home, 
that's a really helpful thing to do as well. Uh, you get much more traction at home uh, taking into yeah. practice some of these tips. Well, thank you again, Sarah, and for all you do in the park service, helping parks get better at this. As we've talked about, there's so much more we can and need to do. Um, and then, Brooke, thank you for this uh, pounding the drum on the importance of thinking about human behavior and not taking individuals for granted. Um, it seems like a lot of times it's like, Hail Mary uh, conservation, where we're hoping for something good to happen in Egypt or somewhere else, but, and it's frustrating because things don't always happen like they need to, and things aren't generally getting better for biodiversity or climate change. They're getting, they're moving in the, the other direction, but that's where individuals can help. It needs to be all, all of the above. Everyone, stay, everyone can play a part. And um, I think it's, you know, through through COVID, right? Everyone living at home. I think a lot of people, at least I guess I did. I found that um, taking individual action made me feel better. It helped me deal with <laughs> these other things that were outside of my my fears and other things that were outside of my control. And um, I feel like we can do more with and not treating the public with like uh, like they can't do more because I think they can and they want to. So yeah, so much more to, to explore on this. So um, I encourage, so thank you again. And for the public and everyone listening in, uh, make sure to, to catch the next presentation. I put the link in there. Uh, it's gonna be kind of like a part two to this presentation in many ways. And then we're gonna be continuing kind of this kind of focus on looking, encouraging and empowering individuals to do conservation. Next year, we're gonna be looking at recreation and a lot of innovative tools that are out there that uh, communities are using to, again, empower communities to get involved and, and make a difference. So I encourage you to, to take a look at our, our Connected Conservation website and register whenever you can. Whenever we get them ready, that's the place to go. So thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of your week. Take care.